Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. I would argue that item level data or receipt level data is the fabric of commerce, right? It's it's so, so, so important to utilize that data properly to power new powerful things. You know, where we're seeing interest is in some of the adjacent spaces for sure. So think like fleet cards, right, that have their own challenges where we can potentially help or health-oriented cards, right? So the food is medicine cards, stuff like that, where I do think long-term we have a role to play. Today, though, we've been quite focused on, for the most part, consumer cards and some commercial cards. That was Jay Han Luth, founder and CEO of Banyan, and he is my special guest on this episode, episode 208 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to make you aware of some opportunities we have here at the Leaders in Payments podcast. We have various sponsorship opportunities, including our upcoming Diversity and Inclusion Month in March. We're also launching a new series of podcasts called The Pulse of Payments, where we're focusing on specific topics for an entire month. For example, We'll cover embedded finance, open banking, cross-border payments, and more. And finally, if you've ever thought about starting your own business podcast, please reach out. We're B2B podcasting experts and can help you launch and market your very own podcast. For more information on any of these opportunities, please contact me directly at greg at leadersinpayments.com. Now, on to the show. What does an avid cook with a graduate degree in law and epidemiology have to do with payments? Well, a lot more than you may think. Banyan founder and CEO Jahan Luth has a passion for item-level data and credits his background in both computer and food science as the foundational building blocks for his success. Banyan set out three years ago to build the infrastructure to both manage and utilize item-level data, think specific items you buy at the store. And with this data, they work with merchants, banks, and fintechs to power new experiences and use cases leveraging this type of granular information. As for their competitive advantage, Jahan talks about powering the rails to leverage experience-based value in a way that has never been done before. In this way, Banyan is not just taking an existing product and trying to make it better, but rather creating the infrastructure for a product that has yet to even be mainstream enough to optimize. Tune in this week to hear Jahan talk about his journey to the role of CEO, the power of atomic nodes, V2 of fintechs, and more. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Jay Han. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Good, good. Me too. So let's dive in with the first question and we'll, we'll jump to your professional journey in just a minute. But to get started, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Sounds great. Sounds great. So I, I grew up in uh, a small city outside of Mumbai in India called Nasik. I came to the United States for grad school and have stayed ever since. My grad school, I went to Penn and got a dual degree, got a master's in law and also a master's in public health focused on epidemiology. And pretty much the highlight is I've been working with item level data or receipt level data ever since. So been been really near and dear to my heart. Okay. And you currently live in New York? I do. I, well, right outside New York City in New Jersey. But yes, in, in uh, our, we're based out of New York. All right. Well, let's discuss the company Banyan. So tell the audience what Banyan does. At, at its very core, Banyan has built the infrastructure and, lack of a better word, plumbing to manage item level data. So what it really means tactically is we work with a bunch of merchants and a bunch of banks and fintechs to power new experiences and use cases leveraging item level data. So for those that are not familiar, but I'm sure many will be considering the audience of your podcast, item level data is the actual items you buy when you go to a store. 
right? So today, if you look at your bank statement, you typically can only see where you spend your money. You cannot see what you bought. What we're building are the rails so that we can power the experiences off of what you bought. So there's a lot of really powerful synergies, both for merchants and for banks and fintechs, where item level data can, you know, power incredible things for their joint customer, right? And really delight their customer. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll dive deep in that. But that's that's a high level about Banyan. Okay. And what are some of those experiences or use cases that your customers use the item level data for? Yeah, the, the biggest one we power today is to do with card linked offers, rewards, or, or anything to do with loyalty. This is a very interesting use case because on one side, the banks and fintechs are looking for better content and more personalized content off of their offers and rewards stack. But because these offers and rewards platforms, many of them don't have the item level data, it's really, really hard to basically run an offer where you get $5 cash back if you spend over 50 bucks when you go to a grocery store, right? That's not very personalized. Where I think you know, we're seeing the ecosystem go is if you have a pet, right, allowing the grocer to run a campaign within the bank that says buy pet food at grocery store X and get Y dollars cash back. So it's much more personalized than kind of the, the some of the older blunt instruments of offers and rewards. That's our biggest one. Another one is, you know, use cases where we power you know, we, we call it atomic nodes, but it's essentially where we bring really large banks and really large retailers together to power a, a very interesting experience. And this could be all the way from better visibility on the small business on, or the commercial card side of things, all the way down to the offers and rewards example I just shared on the consumer card and consumer bank side of things. And, you know, these loyalty programs and card linked offers, I mean, they've been around for a long time. Is what makes you different is that it's truly at a very customizable, specialized, you know, item level. Is that is that really what makes it kind of unique? It does. It does. Right. So, I mean, I don't know the exact history here, but I would argue that loyalty programs and card linked offers have existed since maybe payment rails to a certain extent have been running. But the ingredient that have been that has been used in those offers has been the same for decades and decades. You went to Merchant X and spent $40 and here's an offer to reward that. That is a very different, that was a very different era compared to what we're seeing happen in the fintech world today, where it is an incredibly competitive market for banks and fintechs. And the one who you know, finds a way of engaging their customer the best is the one that drives, you know, higher lifetime value. And that's really where we believe the added ingredient of item level data can make things that banks do today just more relevant and more personal to to me. So, so yeah, I, I think one of our strategies has been how do we work with existing card linked offer providers and platforms so that we don't actually compete with them, but rather empower them to offer a new set of solutions, which the entire ecosystem is kind of gearing up for and eventually will become the consumer expectation, right? That becomes the bar. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So you're based in New York. Are you in just North America, just the U.S., global, sort of what's the reach? Yes, we are primarily in, uh, well, not primarily, we're fully in the United States only for now. But many of the partners we work with are also serve international, uh, you know, regions. So I'm, I'm sure one day we'll, we'll be in a position to venture outside, but for today, primarily focused in, in the U.S. Okay. And sort of... How do you go to market? Do you have a direct sales team calling on banks or fintechs? Do you work through partnerships? Sort of what's the go-to-market strategy? A big part of it are partnerships, right? We very much want to, we think there's a lot of organizations that could run their existing stack potentially better with item level data. 
But the hardest part is once, you know, a bank meets a retailer and I don't make, mean to make this sound like a love story, but in, in some regards <laughs> it is where once a bank meets a retailer and they get excited about a use case they want to power and, you know, both sides see the value in it. When, you know, rubber meets the road, the hardest part is, all right, how do I move, you know, what set of rails or what infrastructure do I leverage so that this isn't a 17 month custom build for that bank and that merchant? That's really where Banyan comes in, right? Where a big bank, a big merchant, they've established value and either that's through existing programs they run or, or new ones that are being facilitated. And Banyan can brace, basically bring their vision to life exponentially quicker than if they were to build this themselves. Okay. And is it just a pretty basic SaaS model? It, it depends. It depends. I think the beauty of being an infrastructure organization is we have really predictable costs. So we're very transparent with our partners on, you know, what our costs are. And then sometimes we have a per transaction fee only. Sometimes we have just a SaaS fee, but most often than not, we have, you know, a combination of a monthly SaaS fee. And on top of that, a per transaction fee of some sort. And how big is the company? You can answer that in, in whatever you feel comfortable, number of employees or revenue or whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. We are 40 people now and we are three years old. So been been uh, building the infrastructure for a few years now and and really excited for what 2023 has to offer. And was it late last year you, you raised a pretty significant round of funding? It was in Q2, Q2 of last year. We, I believe, announced in Q3. But we, we raised a significant round, both comprised of equity and debt. The equity side of things was led by M13, a fund out of LA, and Fin Capital, a fund out of, I guess, Bay Area, New York, Miami. They're everywhere. But... Yeah, we're, we're really excited about the folks that joined our cap table, right? We even had a corporate uh, VC join, which was FIS. So having FIS on the cap table as well, you know, has allowed us to lean in on the partnership strategy and, and kind of lean on them a bit as well. But yes, we, we are well capitalized and are, are in a good spot from a runway standpoint as well. And what do you think those investors saw in the company or, or, or in the, the business model that attracted them to it? I definitely don't want to talk for them, but my <laughs> hypothesis is item level. I mean, if we look at a lot of things that happen in fintech and the banking world, a vast majority of innovation takes place around how to make an existing process better, right? More efficient, mm-hmm. more cost saving or more economical in some way. What's unique about Banyan is we're not building a better mousetrap. We're building a brand new mousetrap. This this has never existed before. And that's not for every investor, right? Some <laughs> some investors will enjoy when there's a well-established market and there's, you know, five players in the market and you, you kind of need to just win on execution. In our case, we need to win on execution and innovation, right? Where we have to create this brand new ecosystem for banks and merchants to talk about and build things that are not just oriented around interchange, right? So a lot of VCs, a lot of investors that have been around the banking ecosystem or been around the retail ecosystem, they they get it, right? This isn't necessarily a very, very hard sale on the conceptual vision of what we're trying to build. It really comes down to, all right, we have the right people building Banyan, we have the right amount of resources, the right amount of runway, and now we need to execute. We've talked about this a a little bit already, but I want to let you answer it in a maybe different way. But what would you say differentiate your company from your competitors? Obviously, you mentioned you're the only ones doing the, you know, item level data, but what what else would you say differentiates your company and who do you see as competitors? 
I mean, our biggest competitor are the merchants and banks deciding to do this themselves, <laughs> right? Mm. It's yeah, a, yeah. in a really weird way, right? Status quo is oftentimes the hardest thing to change. So the our approach to the ecosystem has been the only way to really change status quo is by offering a solution that is better, faster, cheaper all around. And considering these are banks, it also needs to be at the standard of data governance and privacy. And, uh, you know, the sensitivity around any data is so strict, which, as I shared, I, I came from the medical world. So this is the standard I'm used to. So, yeah, in, in terms of our competitors, it's definitely in a large part merchants deciding to do this themselves or, you know, organizations building custom integrations for one merchant or the other. Both of those are incredibly inefficient for the merchant and the bank or the fintech, right? So our goal is to make the decision of, you know, build in-house versus buy the service from Banyan like a no-brainer. It should make all the sense in the world to kind of power our work with Banyan. So where do you see all of this headed, say, in the next two to three years? And certainly you can answer that from a payments industry holistically perspective or, you know, more around the niche that you play in. But where do you see all this going in the next couple of years? Yeah, I I mean, the biggest trend we're seeing right now are merchants and banks are coming together to solve very interesting problems that, that kind of benefit their consumer. I don't think that trend is going to go away. In fact, I would argue it's only going to intensify where banks are going to want to partner with multiple merchants and merchants are going to want to work with multiple banks. Our strategy for the next few years is is really straightforward, right? On, on one side of our business, we need to bring many more of these card linked offers and rewards and, and kind of loyalty platforms we need to empower them to build some really interesting things on top of our rails. But on the other side, we need to build quite a few atomic nodes, which many of them are in our pipeline, but we need to bring this to life, which if for, for many, I'm sure in your audience that have worked with banks before, that can take a little bit of time. <laughs> so we have been uh, patient, but persistent at the same time. On the bank front, are there specific size banks are you working with basically the tier one largest or 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 could it be a a smaller you know you know tier four or five smaller more local bank or is it typically the the larger it's a little bit of both you know we we definitely work with uh you know some tier one banks but we're we're starting to expand our presence with some of the more regional banks and and smaller banks, uh, and primarily because you know we we work with retailers who there's there's very few retailers that are truly fully national, right? If you think about your local grocer that you probably shop at, if I had to guess, I would say it's a regional grocer that probably serves the region of the country you're in. So we do have in in the retail world a lot of super regionals or really large regionals who find a lot of interest in working with community banks, credit unions, or regional banks in their area. So I, I do think there is a role for us to play there. But in the shorter term, we've we've definitely been focused on some of the larger organizations. Is there a lead typically? Is it the is it the bank that comes to you first or the retailer or, you know, sort of are they already kind of together and you know, come to you together or how does that sort of work? Yeah, we, we like to join ourselves at the hip with one of them. (laughs) So, you know, we're, we've either, you know, pitched a bank and we're working with the bank and then we identify the right retailer and, you know, work with the retailer to bring them in. Or sometimes we work with really large retailers um, and they tell us what banks they want to potentially work with. And, we can facilitate that as well. So the short answer is it depends, and it depends by vertical. It depends by the size of the organization on either side, and it works really well when the organizations on both sides are fairly balanced, right? If, if both are national banks and a national retailer, great. If the regional bank, reta- regional retailer, great. 
Sometimes we're doing really large banks with regional retailers, but that's that's more of an edge case for us. And, you know, we've talked about the banks and the retailers and fintechs. Are there other sort of verticals or players that you see getting into this space that we haven't really covered? Oh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I would argue that item level data or receipt level data is kind of the the fabric of commerce, right? It's it's so, so, so important to utilize that data properly to power new powerful things. You know, where we're seeing interest is in some of the adjacent spaces for sure. So think like fleet cards, right, that have their own challenges where we can potentially help or health oriented cards, right? So the food is medicine cards, stuff like that, where I do think long term we have a role to play. Today, though, we've been quite focused on, for the most part, consumer cards and some commercial cards. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us about your journey to your role there as the founder and CEO. Oh, yeah. It's been an interesting one because if if you look at my background, I started my formal education all the way from computer science, then did a brief stint at culinary school studying food science after which I went to, to grad school, as I mentioned. In a really, really weird way, the common theme throughout all of this has been receipt level data. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, I feel that this was meant to be and founding Banyan was meant to be. In the medical space, you know, we were building clinical trials where people had to take pictures of paper receipts, right? And we used that data to better understand what are people buying and how does that affect their health. The challenge we had was asking people to take pictures of paper receipts is probably the most agonizing and painful thing <laughs> to, to, to do, right? And if, if you filed an expense report before or if you've taken photos of receipts where you absolutely have to keep track of the receipt, it's, it's stressful for a lot of people. This was when we were starting to see a lot of themes in the open banking world where consumers were given a right to their data and the consumer actually was able to access their information in applications they choose. And we saw that that makes a ton of sense for kind of V1, if you may, of a fintech, which in a large part was how do we get account level data and KYC data via aggregation? But I think where V2, which we are building for, is, all right, now let's assume every fintech has data via an aggregator or every bank has better, cleaner transaction data. How can we go the next level deeper? So, yeah, in, in a weird way, I feel like my life has been, <laughs> and my entire professional life has been oriented towards this mission. And anytime there's a unique name of a company, I have to ask where the name came from. So can you, can you explain the, the name Banyan? <laughs> yes, uh, Banyan is is quite an auspicious tree based out of India, right? And and it's obviously in Florida as well, and and you know it's a very tropical tree. But one thing that's really unique about Banyan is it, the kind of ecology around the tree, where it's in a very large part, it's an ecosystem where different animals, birds, fungi, you know, everything resorts. And if you've ever seen a Banyan tree. You've probably seen like a ton of roots that go up and down and it's 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 pretty cool. So we pay homage to the banyan tree and really you know admire the ecosystem it builds around it. Well, what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one work related passion and one personal passion. All right. All right. That's a great, great question. Work related passion is Every time I, I think I talk to someone about item level data, they more often than not think about a use case which is different, right? <laughs> and creativity and the excitement which organizations and people have around item level data is is quite exciting. And that's that's where my passion is, is kind of being with customers and learning from them on on what's what do they want to build next. In terms of Personally, I am a avid cook. I love food and I love cooking. And 
you know, we're, we're lucky that we live, you know, in, in Jersey where we can get a lot of incredible summertime vegetables, right? The Jersey corn and tomatoes and, and a lot of incredible ingredients that you need to do very, very little to, <laughs> to, to enjoy them. So I very much love cooking. So what is your specialty? What, what do you cook that's really, really good? Ooh, well, I'm, I'm going to put the Indian heritage aside for a second because I, I think I'm biased on <laughs> cooking some, some <laughs> uh, hopefully, Indian food. But more typically, my family and I, we, we love a lot of the Mediterranean cuisine. So things like a nice you know, steamed fish or grilled fish along with couscous and some nice vegetables and you know, so we're very much trying to be as pescatarian as possible, but sometimes that's not possible. So but that's, yeah. <laughs> Good. You're making me hungry. So I always like to, to ask this question because you get a lot of unique answers to it. But, you know, when I started in payments, I don't know, many, many years ago, you know, fintech didn't exist. Payments wasn't quite what it is today. There's been a lot of money. It's it's grown as an industry, a lot of money invested in the industry. Kids in college can take courses about fintech now. And people look at payments and fintech as a career opportunity. How do I build a career in this space where I want to? So let's say you have someone coming out of college. They come to you for some advice and say, hey, what do I need to do to be successful in, in the fintech or payment space? What would you tell them? Oh, it's a great question. I think there's a couple couple things. So first off, it's really, really important to have the foundational knowledge of how money moves, how money is made, how people access their money. That's almost like V1. And sometimes this can be done via nice internships. Sometimes it's, you know, companies that are solving interesting things. But outside of that, the reality is I look at fintech as a instrument for change, Right. And I mean, look at my background, right? I went to culinary school, then medical and law school, and I'm I'm, uh, now working at a fintech. So it's an instrument of change where it actually helps to have a different perspective at the table rather than one which has been, you know, 40 years in X or 40 years in Y is sometimes really challenging to innovate around. So my, my, oftentimes my advice to anyone looking to joining fintech, one is, you know, if you do take the leap of faith, get some foundational knowledge as fast as possible, but you don't need to be banking expert to solve problems for people that have, you know, around money. I'll give you another example. I've, I've seen a lot of interesting, powerful technology being built for immigrants in in the U.S. And turns out the founders are immigrants as well. So it, it's the level of empathy they have towards a use case is, is quite large than the founders being experts on payments for decades, right, as an example. It, you definitely need to have both, but I often over-index on making sure you're really passionate about a problem you're solving. Okay. I think that's uh, very, very sound advice. So we've covered a lot about the company, the industry, where it's heading, you and your your personal journey. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I, I hope your audience finds this interesting. And maybe the one thing I'll leave everyone with is item level data is here. <laughs> it's, it's here to stay. And, you know, i if you have creative ideas of what you'd like to build, we're just uh, an email away. Okay. And, and what would be the best way for people to reach out to you or, or to the company? It's really simple. My name is Jehan, J-E-H-A-N, at Banyan.com. So I'm, anyone can reach out to me and I'll make sure the right people from our site are, are coordinated. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jayhan, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I want to I want to respect that. So thank you again for being on the show and we'll definitely stay in touch and, and hopefully have you on again in, uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. 
If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.